Amen. Thanks for that blessing. I was sitting there trying to figure out who was playing guitar because the keyboard and stand were in my way. Of course, I knew Austin was up here, and the other person was wearing cowboy boots, jeans, and flannel shirt. I thought, I bet that's Nick. <laughs> Plus, I knew he was musically gifted, so I thought that, that was a little bit of a clue. Every day, all over the world, people are celebrating birthdays, right? I mean, every day, somebody is having a birthday. Well, tomorrow, everybody, or not everybody, but most everybody around the world are going to be celebrating the birthday of one particular person. And of course, that person is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And I know that not everybody, as they gather around the tree and open presents or enjoy a nice meal, not everybody's necessarily going to be thinking about Jesus or honoring his birthday. But even so, it's because of what happened on that first Christmas that all this is taking place today and tomorrow. Special birthday. And today we're going to talk about birthday parties. That sounds kind of fun, doesn't it? Talk about birthday parties today. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. This is the story of the wise men, and they're on their way to Mary and Joseph's house. And I don't necessarily think it was a birthday party they were going to, but even so, they present gifts to the Lord. And we're going to read Matthew chapter 2. Do we have that on the screen available for us? If not, I have something called a Bible <laughs> that I am going to turn to. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. It says that after they had heard the king, they had consulted with King Herod, remember, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with the mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of golden incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country another way. Now like you, I have been to my fair share of birthday parties over the years. But I want to tell you about my favorite remembrance of a birthday party. It happened about 25 years ago. I was an associate pastor in Newton Falls, Ohio, working under Pastor Austin Sowers. And my wife was about 24, 25 at the time, and her best friend was twice her age then. She was about to turn 50, and her name was Sandy. Well, Sandy's family had decided to have a surprise 50th birthday party for Sandy. And so they recruited me and Cindy to kind of help out. Now, the birthday party was going to be at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon at the American Legion Hall. They had rented out, and they came to me and Cindy and said, Now, what we'd like for you to do is invite Sandy over to your house for lunch. <laughs> but here was the catch. We couldn't feed her. You know, after church on Sunday, they said, we want you to have her over to your house, but don't feed her because they're going to have a full meal at the birthday party. We don't want her to come having already eaten. So invite her over to your house. So Cindy and I came up with this plan. Cindy's so good at this stuff. <laughs> so we had invited Sandy earlier in the week over to our house for lunch. And so when we come home, it's probably about 12, 15, 12, 30. And we go into the kitchen and Cindy pretends to have forgotten to take the meat out of the freezer, you know. Now, really, there was no lunch planned at all, but she pretends that she forgot, and she's kind of like, what are we going to do, you know? And she looks at me, and she says, well, you know, it is Sandy's birthday. We, we could take her out to eat. That would be nice. And I said, and this was all planned ahead of time, you know, I said, well, you know, Brother Austin was telling me about a fish fry, that was taking place over at the American Legion at 2 o'clock. And we could take her there. And, and I said, and the good thing is it's only $4. <laughs> now, you know, if you're planning on taking somebody out, you don't tell them the price. You know, you don't say, hey, it's only $4. But this was all part of the plan. So Cindy and I had planned, you see, to have a fake fight. She looks at me and says, William, because Austin was known for being cheap, you know, 
She said, just because you work for Brother Austin doesn't mean you need to be cheap like he is. You know, he pinched pennies like crazy. Uh, and that's where they discovered copper wire. Somebody tried to take a penny out of Brother Austin's hand one time. <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> and so Cindy and I have this pretend argument right in front of Sandy. Well, this is a great stall tactic. Because, you know, Sandy's not going to say a word. You know how awkward it is to see a couple bickering in front of you, you know? So she wasn't going to say anything. And Cindy and I, I got really defensive, like, you know, when she called me cheap. And so we kind of pretend to have a little argument right there in front of Sandy. So the next half hour or so was rather quiet. <laughs> but the plan for Sandy not to eat was working like a charm. Well, finally, it gets to be close to 2 o'clock. So we drive over to the American Legion. And, of course, Sandy's family was already there waiting for her. And when we pull into the parking lot, Sandy sees the car that belongs to her stepfather. And she says, hey, there, there's my stepfather's car. And Cindy and I look at each other like, oh, no, that's going to ruin it all. She's going to figure it out. And Sandy says, Sandy goes, well, that makes sense because Frank loves fish. It's like... So it worked great. She thought he was there for the fish fry, you know. Plus, he was cheap, too, so he likes to say we're dying. <laughs> and so she didn't have a clue. We walked in, and Sandy's family hollered, you know, surprise and everything, and she, did, she fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Funny part was, about 20 minutes later, Sandy comes up to me and Cindy and says, so you and William really weren't fighting? <laughs> You really weren't having an argument? We said, no. And she's like, oh, good, I'm so glad. <laughs> See, that was devious strategy and underhanded tactics, and that just happens to be Cindy's and my spiritual gifts. And so that was <laughs> right in our wheelhouse, you know what I'm saying? You know, birthday parties usually are fun occasions, and every birthday party, if you stop and think about it, is unique whether it's the time or the date or the people involved or the gifts given, no two birthday parties are exactly the same. But there are some similarities that every good birthday party, or just about every good birthday party, has. And so what we're going to talk about today is what every good birthday party means, because this is Jesus' birthday party that we're talking about, Jesus' birthday that we're celebrating. So I want to mention three things that every good birthday party Needs. All right. All right. First of all, there are presents for the birthday boy. Now, I know there are some birthday parties where there may not be gifts, especially if it's a birthday for a, a, an adult or something like that. They might say no gifts, please, or something like that. But for the most part, you know, when you're having a birthday, especially for a child, you know, birthday presents are not part of it. So here we are celebrating Jesus's birthday tomorrow. And of course, Jesus is the birthday boy. And we run into a little bit of a, of a quandary, right? Because there are a couple of things that make this a little bit difficult when it comes to giving Jesus a birthday present. First of all, Jesus is not here in the flesh. And so that's a bit of a pickle that we run into. Because, okay, what do you, what do you give to Jesus if he's not here in the flesh? You can't give him something material, really, because... I mean, if you give him a video game, he can't play it. If you give him a car, even, right, he's not going to drive it. And so you run into a little bit of a problem there. And, and so there, there's, you just can't give Jesus material things. So if you lay it under the tree, he's not going to unwrap it. Not that he couldn't, but he just won't because he's not here in the flesh. That time has passed. And so that's one problem we run into. The second problem we run into is that Jesus already owns everything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says, belong to him. And so if he owns everything, then what can you get him? You know, you always hear about what do you buy the person who has everything? You ever said that before or heard that before? Well, with Jesus, it's literally true. I mean, he really does own it all. And so that's the problem we run into. It's Jesus's birthday. So what do you get him? You really can't give him anything material because he's not here in the flesh to utilize it, and he owns everything, so what do you do? Well, let me give you just a few suggestions. Let me give you three things that you can give to Jesus at Christmas time, at any time for that matter. One thing is the Christ's birthday offering we're doing at the end of the service. 
Yeah, the history behind that is that the, the women of the Church of God, which is now called Christian Women Connection, began this decades ago. I think it was back in the 30s or sometime. Uh, to help support missions around the world. And it seems to make sense that if we're going to give presents for everybody else at Christmas time, we ought to also remember Jesus. Now you say, well, I thought you said Jesus doesn't need anything material. So why does he need money? Well, he doesn't need the money, of course, but the money builds up his kingdom. So you see, if we can give something that's going to help his kingdom, then it helps Jesus. It helps God. Not that I think he necessarily needs our help, but he uses our help. He chooses to work through us. So that's one thing. Another thing, too, if you don't have funds to give, for example, you can always give of your service. In fact, we always ought to do that. I mean, the Christmas caroling I talked about last week, I think that was a great gift that all of you <laughs> went provided for the people of the church. Or feeding the hungry or visiting the sick. There are always things we can do of service to the kingdom of God that, in a sense, is like presenting Jesus with something special for Christmas. But then the third thing, and of course this is the most important, is giving yourself to Jesus. That's the most important. Because you, know, you can give all your money, and you can even give your service to him, but if you don't give your heart to him, then you haven't given what God values most. In fact, that's why Jesus came into this world, was to have a relationship with us, because we had separated that relationship through our sin, and he wanted to reconcile us to himself, so that's why he came. And so Romans 12 and verse 1 says that we are to, to give ourselves to him to consecrate ourselves as living sacrifices to him. And that's what God desires more than anything else. So first of all, if, you're, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, to give your heart to him, to repent of your sins, and ask him for forgiveness, that you would be your Savior, and have a relationship with him. If you haven't done that, to do that today, that would be the first step. And then if you do already know him, to dedicate your all to him. We call that consecration. To consecrate or dedicate your entire self to him. To present yourself to him as a living sacrifice, and he may use you entirely. And so those are the kinds of gifts that we can give to Jesus at Christmas time, and, and really all year long, they're appropriate for him. So a good birthday party has presents for the birthday boy. Second thing that a good birthday party has is a celebration for the birthday boy. In Matthew 2.10, it says that when the, the wise men saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And we sing the song, Joy to the World. Jesus' birth certainly brings joy to the world. Wouldn't you agree with that? His, his life with us, his presence with us, ought to bring about joy and celebration. And so as we come to his birth and to, to look at it tomorrow, we ought to be celebrating. We ought to be rejoicing in his birth. And not just at Christmas time, but always. Do you know joy ought to be part and parcel of our Christian lives every day? That we ought to be joy-filled people. And certainly at Christmas time with his birthday, let me ask you this, could you imagine going to a birthday party and you have your presents under your arm and, and maybe even some balloons and you're all ready for a happy occasion? Can you imagine walking in and finding everybody sitting around the room <coughs> with real somber looks on their faces, maybe even dressed in black. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? You'd think you'd gone to a gothic kind of birthday party or something. And there's no music playing. There's no celebration. There's no kids running around. It's just dead. It's like awake. Now, you've never been to a birthday party like that. Do you know why? Because birthday parties are times of celebration. They're times of joy. And that should characterize our lives at Christmas. Not just on Christmas, but every day. You know, a lot of times people think when we become Christians, we're supposed to, I don't know, walk around like we've been sucking on a lemon or something. Like we're just all sour and sore and unhappy. I read about this one young man. He was called to be a pastor, and they had an ordination service for him, and he got ordained. And this lady walked up to him at the reception. And she said to him, you know, it's very admirable what you're doing, giving up the joys of life to become a minister. And it's like, what? I don't know, when you became a Christian, I hope you didn't think you were giving up all the joys of life, did you? In fact, I think it's when we come to know Jesus that we really come to understand what real joy is all about. The Bible says in Psalm 16 that in God's presence, there is fullness 
of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And Jesus said that he came that we would have life and that we would have life more abundantly. And all the happiness and pleasures that the world has to offer, that Satan gives us is so fleeting and doesn't bring satisfaction. You know, you can have, I was talking to a guy just a week ago who said he, had, he was very rich at one point in his life. He had everything he thought he wanted, but he said, I never was happy until I came to know Jesus. You know, Jesus is where joy is. And all the stuff of the world just brings fleeting happiness, maybe, maybe for a time. But we ought to have joy in Christ. In fact, you look at the fruit of the Spirit. What are they? They're nine, remember? Love is first. What's second? Joy. Certainly ought to be a part of our lives, a big part of our lives. You know, one of my favorite Bible teachers is Chuck Swindoll. Y'all heard Chuck Swindoll? I, a lot of you have. You just don't know how to raise your hand. Too much energy to exert this morning, huh? <laughs> Come on, how many of y'all know who Chuck Swindoll is? All right, all right, all right. And I suppose he's, he's been on the radio now for, for quite a long time. And he always, always had a great sense of humor. You know, in fact, about 20 years ago, he wrote a book called Laugh Again. And he said, though, that when he was called to be a pastor, when he was a young man, he said his number one fear was that he was going to have to be somber and serious-minded all the time. In fact, he said that he actually resisted the call to ministry because, as he put it, he said, all the clergymen I knew at the time looked like they held a night job down at the local mortuary. <laughs> and he said, I didn't want anything to do with that. Because, you know, Chuck Swindoll is a fun-loving guy, you know, he laughs. In fact, it's great when he tells a story. He'll start laughing at his own stories. It's so funny. But he said, finally, he sensed God saying to him, Chuck, you can be faithful to me and still be yourself. And you can continue to laugh and enjoy life. And that's so true. Man, I hope you don't check your humor at the door when you come to church or as you live out your Christian life, think, well, I can't be funny or I can't laugh or I can't have a good time. I can't live it up. Of course you can. Jesus has invited us to do so. I think God takes great pleasure in our laughter and in our joy. In fact, I would say that if we have decided that we're not going to laugh and have a good time as Christians, I think it's a poor advertisement for Jesus. I really do. Because Jesus loves it. I mean, he, the Bible even talks about God laughing. And I tell you, one of my favorite things to do is give a bunch of people a laugh and have a good time. And so I, I hope that you'll make that a part of your life if it's not. And have a good, positive attitude about life and smile once in a while. Yeah, I wouldn't plan on saying this, but I saw this guy he worked in security at the mall yesterday. And uh, he was on one of those second ways, you know, just zooming around the Woodland Hills Mall. And he just looked really, really sad. Not very attractive face because of the way it was just hanging there, you know. And he went around this one loop and was coming back. And I saw a lady, I don't know if he knew her or what, but she said hi. And he said hi and he smiled. I thought, boy, he looks so much happier and so much nicer, so much more pleasant when he smiled. Your smile does you good. I heard John Maxwell's testimony on this one time. Talk about smiling and enjoying life. He said that when he was a young man going into ministry and everything, you know, he looked in the mirror. And he thought, boy, that ain't much work to work with. You know, <laughs> he just saw the reflection in the mirror. And then he smiled. And he said, oh, that's better. <laughs> Smile once in a while. You know, let joy come out of your life. It's a good thing. It's a great advertisement for Jesus because Jesus ought to help us to enjoy life more. So it's Christmas and, and all year long ought to be a time of celebration in our lives. All right, so we have presents for the birthday boy. We have a celebration for the birthday boy. You know what else every good birthday party needs? The birthday boy. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one, too. <laughs> but you know, no birthday party is ready to start until what? The birthday boy or the birthday girl is there. You could have everybody else there, but if, if Susie's not there or Johnny's not there, well, we got to wait till he gets here. It's his birthday, after all. So we have to wait. And so that's when the birthday really takes off. Well, what about Christmas? What about with Jesus? You know, a lot of people are going to have birthday parties tomorrow. But not invite Jesus. And can you imagine if it were your birthday? 
and you saw people inviting each other to a party, and you're like, well, what about me? It's your birthday. And they say, oh, no, we, no, we're inviting everybody else. We don't want you to come. We want everybody else to come. And we're going to exchange gifts, and we're going to have a good meal. And, you know, and you're like, well, don't bother anybody. I just want a piece of pie or something. No, we don't want you to come. But we invite everybody else. Don't you think that's why Jesus must feel sometimes? At Christmas time? I want to show you a video. It's a little bit over three minutes long. Michael Jr., if you've heard of him, he's a Christian comedian, put this together. And um, it really doesn't mean much setup. It's about Mark's birthday. So take a look at this. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it, when Michael Jr., he's the African-American guy, he's talking to the other guy, and he says, how long have you known Mark? Well, I don't really know him that well. I don't talk to him as much as I should. But hey, it's Mark's birthday. <laughs> kind of makes you think a lot about Christmas, huh? People say, well, how long have you known Jesus? Well, I don't really know him. I don't talk to him that much. But it's Jesus' birthday. It's Christmas, and so we celebrate. It's a sad thing to think that in many homes, Jesus... Tomorrow is going to be on the outside looking in. Almost as though his face were pressed up against the window. Watching people gather around the tree, opening presents, enjoying a nice meal. <clears throat> maybe watching a movie or something. And he's just like, but it's my birthday. With little or no acknowledgement at all. Yes. Let's not ha let that happen in our homes. Let's not let that happen in our hearts. But let's celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ by giving him his rightful place 
and truly honoring him, not just for his birth, but for his life, his death, his resurrection, and for all that he means to us today. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Will you stand, please? Our Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in this day as we look forward to celebrating.